This Reformation audio resource is a production of Still Waters Revival Books. There is no copyright on this material, and we encourage you to reproduce it and pass it on to your friends. Many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com by phone at area code 780-450-3730 by fax at area code 780-468-1096 or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada T6L 3T5 If you do not have a web connection please request a free printed catalog. The Doctrine of Repentance by Thomas Watson first published in 1668 as read by Samantha Alloway. Page 3 If the book of the law chance to fall upon the ground, the Jews have a custom presently to proclaim a fast. England has let both law and gospel fall to the ground, therefore needs to fast and mourn before the Lord. The ephah of wickedness seems to be full. There is good reason for tears to empty a pace when sin fills so fast. Why then do not all faces gather paleness? Why are the wells of repentance stopped? Do not the sinners of the land know that they should repent? Have they no warning? Have not God's faithful messengers lifted up their voice as a trumpet and cried to them to repent? but many of these tools in the ministry have been spent and worn out upon rocky hearts. Has not God lighted strange comets in the heavens as so many preachers to call men to repentance, but still they are settled on their knees? Zephaniah 1 verse 12 Do we think that God will always put up with our affront? Will he endure thus to have his name and glory trampled upon? The Lord has usually been more swift in the process of his justice against the sins of a professing people. God may reprieve this land a while by prerogative, but if ever he save it without repentance, he must go out of his ordinary road. I say therefore with Mr. Bradford, Repent, O England! You have, be- you have beleppered yourself with sin and must needs go and wash in the spiritual Jordan. You have kindled God's anger against you. Throw away your weapons and bring your holy engines and waterworks that God may be appeased in the blood of Christ. Let your tears run. Let God's roll of curses fly. Zechariah 5 verse 2 Either men must turn or God will overturn. Either the foul ground of their hearts must be broken up or the land broken down. If no words will prevail with sinners, it is because God has a purpose to slay them. 1 Samuel 2.25 Among the Romans it was concluded that he who for his capital offense was forbidden the use of water was a condemned person. So they who by their prodi- prodigious sins have so far incensed the God of heaven that he denies them the water of repentance may look upon themselves as condemned persons. 3. Repentance is necessary for the cheating crew. Their deceit is falsehood. Psalm 119, verse 118. They are wise to do evil. Jeremiah 4, verse 22. Making use of their invention only for circumvention. Instead of living by their faith, they live by their shift. These are they who make themselves poor, so that by this artifice they may grow rich. I would not be misunderstood. I do not mean such as the providence of God has brought low, whose estates have failed but not their honesty, but rather such as feign a break, that they may cheat their creditors. There are some who get more by breaking than others can by trading. These are like beggars that discolor and blister their arms so that they may move charity. As they live by their sores, so these live by their breaking. When the frost breaks, the streets are more full of water. Likewise, many tradesmen, when they break, are fuller of money. These make as if they had nothing, but out of this nothing great estates are created. 
Remember the kingdom of heaven is taken by force, not by fraud. Let men know that after this golden sop the devil enters. They squeeze a curse into their estate. They must repent quickly. Though the bread of falsehood be sweet, Proverbs 20 verse 17, yet many vomit up their sweet morsels in hell. Fourth, repentance is necessary for civil persons. These have no visible spots on them. They are free from gross sin, and one would think they had nothing to do with the business of repentance. They are so good that they scorn a psalm of mercy. Indeed, these are often in the worst condition. These are they who need no repentance. Luke 15 verse 7 Their civility undoes them. They make a Christ of it, and so on this shelf they suffer shipwreck. Morality shoots short of heaven. It is only nature refined. A moral man is but old Adam dressed in fine clothes. The king's image, counterfeited and stamped upon brass, will not go current. The civil person seems to have the image of God, but he is only brass metal, which will never pass for the current. Civility is insufficient for salvation. Though the life be moralized, the lust may be unmortified. The heart may be full of pride and atheism. Under the fair leaves of a tree there may be a worm. I am not saying, repent that you are civil, but that you are no more than civil. Christ entered into the house that, has, that had just been swept and garnished. Luke 11:26. This is the emblem of a moral man who is swept by civility and garnished with common gifts but is not washed by true repentance. The unclean spirit enters into such a one. If civility were sufficient to salvation, Christ needs not have died. The civilian has a fair lamp, but it lacks the oil of grace. Fifth, repentance is needful for hypocrites. I mean such as allow themselves in the sin. Hypocrisy is the counterfeiting of sanctity. The hypocrite or stage player has gone a step beyond the moralist and dressed himself in the garb of religion. He pretends to a form of godliness but denies the power. 2 Timothy 3 verse 5 The hypocrite is a, is a saint in jest. He makes a magnificent show like an ape clothed in ermine or purple. The hypocrite is like a house with a beautiful facade but every room within is dark. He is a rotten post fairly gilded. Under his mask of profession he hides his plague sores. The hypocrite is against painting of faces, but he paints holiness. He is seemingly good so that he may be really bad. In Samuel's mantle he plays the devil. Therefore, therefore the same word in the original signifies to use hypocrisy and to be profane. The hypocrite seems to have his eyes nailed to heaven, but his heart is full of impure lusting. He lives in secret sin against his conscience. He can be as his company is and act both the dove and the vulture. He hears the word but is all ear. He is for temple devotion where others may look upon him and admire him, but he neglects family and closet prayer. Indeed, if prayer does not make a man leave sin, sin will make him leave prayer. The hypocrite feigns humility, but it is that he may rise in the world. He is a pretender to faith, but he makes use of it rather for a cloak than a shield. He carries his Bible under his arm, but not in his heart. His whole religion is a demure lie, Hosea 11:12. But is there such a generation of men to be found? The Lord forgive them their holiness. Hypocrites are in the gall of bitterness, Acts 8:23. Oh, how they need to humble themselves in the dust. They are far gone with the rot. And if anything can cure them, it must be feeding upon the salt marshes of repentance. Let me speak my mind freely. Men will find it more difficult to repent than hypocrites. They have so juggled in religion that their treacherous hearts know not how to repent. Hypocrisy is harder to cure than frenzy. The hy- hypocrite's in- imposture in, the heart, in his heart seldom breaks. If it be not late, seek yet to God for mercy. Such as are guilty of prevailing hypocrisy, let them fear and tremble. Their condition is sinful and sad. 
It is sinful because they do not re- embrace religion out of choice, but design. They do not love it, only paint it. It is sad upon a double account. Firstly, because this art of deceit cannot hold long. He who hangs out a sign that has not the commodity of grace in his heart must needs break at last. Secondly, because God's anger will fall heavier upon hypocrites. They dishonor God more and take away the gospel's good name. Therefore the Lord reserves the most deadly arrows in his quiver to shoot at them. If heathens be damned, hypocrites shall be double damned. Hell is, the, call, hell is called the place of hypocrites, Matthew 24:51, as if it were chiefly prepared for them and were to be settled up upon them in fee simple, that is, unconditional inheritance. 6. Repentance is necessary for God's own people who have a real work of grace and are Israelites indeed. They must offer up a daily sacrifice of tears. The antinomians hold that when any come to be believers, they have a writ of ease, and there remains nothing for them now to do but to rejoice. Yes, they have something else to do, and that is to repent. Repentance is a continuous act. The issue of godly sorrow must not be quite stopped till death. Jerome, writing in an epistle to Leeta, tells her that her life must be a life of repentance. Repentance is called crucifying the flesh, Galatians 5.24, which is not done on a sudden, but leisurely. It will be doing all our life. And are there not many reasons why God's own people should go into the weeping bath? Are there not with you, even with you, sins against the Lord? Second Chronicles 28.10 have, you, have not you sins of daily incursion? Though you are diamonds, have you no flaws? Do we not read of the spots of God's children? Deuteronomy 32 verse 5 See with the candle of the word into your heart and see if you can find no matter for repentance there. A. Repent of your rash, rash sh- censuring. Instead of praying for others, you are ready to pass a verdict upon them. It is true that the saints shall judge the world, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, but stay your time. Remember the apostles' caution in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. B. Repent of your vain thoughts. These swarm in your mind as the flies did in Pharaoh's court, Exodus 8:24. What bewilderings there are in the imagination. If Satan does not possess your bodies, he does your fancies. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? Jeremiah 4:14. 4, a man may think himself into hell. O saints, be humbled for this lightness in your head. See, repent of your vain fashions. It is strange that the garments which God has given to cover shame should discover pride. The godly are bid not to be conformed to this world. Romans 12:2. People of the world are garish and light in their dresses. It is in fashion nowadays to go to hell. But whatever others do, yet let not Judah offend. Hosea 4 verse 15 The Apostle Paul has set down what upper garment Christians must wear, modest apparel, 1 Timothy 2 verse 9, and what undergarment, be clothed with humility, 1 Peter 5 5. D. Repent of your decays in grace. Thou hast left thy first love. Revelation 2.4 Christians, how often is it low water in your souls? How often does your cold fit come upon you? Where are those flames of affection, those sweet meltings of spirit that you once had? I fear they are melted away. Oh, repent for leaving your first love. E. Repent of your non-improvement of talents. Health is a talent, estate is a talent, wit and parts are talents, and these God has entrusted you with to improve for his glory. He has sent you into the world as a merchant sends his factor beyond the seas to trade for his master's advantage, but ye have not done the good you might. Can you say, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds? Luke 19.18 O mourn at the burial of your talents, 
Let it grieve you that so much of your age has not been time lived, but time lost, that you have filled up your golden hours more with froth than with spirits. F. Repent of your forgetfulness of sacred vows. A vow is a binding one sold to God. Numbers 30 verse 2. Christians, have not you, since you have been bound to God, forfeited your indentures? Have you not served for common uses after you have been the Lord's by solemn dedication? Thus by breach of vows you have made a breach in your peace. Surely this calls for a fresh labor of tears. G. Repent of your unanswerableness to blessings received. You have lived all your life upon free quarter. You have spent your stock of free free graces. You have been bemiracled with mercy. But where are your returns of love to God? The Athenians would have ungrateful persons sued at law. Christians, may not God sue you at law for your unthankfulness? I will recover my wool and my flax. Hosea 2 verse 9 I will recover them by law. H. Repent of your worldliness. By your profession you seem to resemble the birds of paradise that soar aloft and live upon the dew of heaven, yet as serpents you lick the dust. Barak, a good man, was taxed with this. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Jeremiah 45 verse 5 I. Repent of your divisions. These are a blot in your coat armor and make others stand aloof from religion. Indeed, to separate from the wicked resembles Christ, who was separate from sinners, Hebrews 7.26. But for the godly to divide among themselves and look askew one upon another, had we as many eyes as there are stars, there were few enough to weep for this. Divisions eclipse the church's beauty and weaken her strength. God's Spirit brought in cloven tongues among the saints, Acts 2 verse 3 but the devil has brought in cloven hearts. Surely this deserves a shower of tears. Whoever is sowing such things, can he refrain from tears? J. Repent for the iniquity of your holy things. How often have the services of God's worship been frozen with formality and soured with pride? There have been more of the peacock's plumes than the groans of the dove. It is sad that ever duties of religion should be made a stage for vainglory to act upon. O Christian, there is such a thick rind, or crust, upon your duties that it is to be feared there is but little meat left in them for God to feed upon. Behold here repenting work cut out for the best, and that which may make the tide of grief swell higher is to think that the sins of God's people do more provoke God than do the sins of others. Deuteronomy 32, verse 19. The sins of the wicked pierce Christ's side. The sins of the godly go to his heart. Peter's sin, being against so much love, was most unkind, which made his cheeks to be furrowed with tears. When he thought thereon, he wept. Mark 14, 72. 3. Repentance is necessary for all sins. Let us be deeply humbled and mourn before the Lord for original sin. We have lost that pure quintessential frame of soul that once we had. Our nature is vitiated with corruption. Original sin has diffused itself as a poison into the whole man, like the Jerusalem artichoke, which wherever it is planted soon overruns the ground. There are not worse worse natures in hell than we have. The hearts of the best are like Peter's sheet, on which there were a number of unclean, creeping things. Acts 10, verse 12 This primitive corruption is bitterly to be bewailed, because we are never free from it. It is like a spring underground, which though it is not seen, yet it still runs. We may as well stop the beating of the pulse as stop the motions to sin. This inbred depravity retards and hinders us in that which is spiritual. The good that I would, I do not. Romans 7, verse 19. Original sin may be compared to that fish Pliny speaks of, a sea lamprey, which cleaves to the keel of the ship and hinders it when it is under sail. Footnote. 
Pliny was a Roman writer on natural history in the first century A.D. End of footnote. Sin hangs weights upon us so that we move but slowly to heaven. Oh, this adherence of sin! Paul shook the viper which was on his hand into the fire. Acts 28 verse 5 But we cannot shake off original corruption in this life. Sin does not come as a lodger for a night, but as an indweller. Sin that dwelleth in me. Romans 7.17 It is with us as with one who has a hectic fever upon him. Though he changes the air, yet still he carries his disease with him. Original sin is inexhaustible. This ocean cannot be emptied. Though the stock of sin spends, yet it is not at all diminished. The more we sin, the fuller we are of sin. Original corruption is like the widow's oil, which increased by pouring out. Another wedge to break our hearts is that original sin mixes with the very habits of grace. Hence it is that our actings toward heaven are so dull and languid. Why does faith act no stronger but because it is clogged with sense? Why does love to God burn no purer but because it is hindered with lust? Original sin incorporates with our graces. As bad lungs cause cause an asthma or shortness of breath, so original sin having infected our heart, our graces breathe now very faintly. Thus we see what in original sin may draw forth our tears. In particular, let us lament the corruption of our will and our affections. Let us mourn for the corruption of our will. The will, not following the dictamen, that is the precept or injunction of right reason, is biased to evil. The will distastes, that is, dislikes God, not as he is good, but as he is holy. It contumaciously affronts him. We will do whatsoever goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven. Jeremiah 44, verse 17 The greatest wound has fallen upon our will. Let us grieve for the diversion of our affections. They are taken off from their proper object. The affections, like arrows, shoot beside the mark. At the beginning our affections were wings to fly to God. Now they are weights to pull us from him. Let us grieve for the inclination of our affections. Our love is set on sin, our joy on the creature. Our affections, like the lapwing, feed on dung. How justly may the distemper of our affections bear a part in the scene of our grief. We of ourselves are falling into hell, and our affections would thrust us thither. Let us lay to heart actual sins, Of these I may say, Who can understand his errors? Psalm 19 verse 12 They are like atoms in the sun, like sparks of a furnace. We have sinned in our eyes. They have been casements to let in vanity. We have sinned in our tongues. They have been fired with passion. What action proceeds from us wherein we do not betray some sin? To reckon up these were to go to number the drops in the ocean. Let actual sins be solemnly repented of before the Lord. Chapter 7 Powerful Motives to Repentance That the exhortation to repentance may be more quickened, I shall lay down some powerful motives to excite repentance. 1. Sorrow and melting of heart fits us for every holy duty. A piece of lead, while it is in the lump, can be put to no use, but melt it, and you may then cast it into any mold, and it is made useful. So a heart that is hardened into a lump of sin is good for nothing, but when it is dissolved by repentance, it is useful. A melting heart is fit to pray. When Paul's heart was humbled and melted, then, behold, he prayeth, Acts 9.11. It is fit to hear the word. Now the word works kindly. When Josiah's heart was tender, he humbled himself and rent his clothes at the hearing of the words of the law. 2 Chronicles 34.19 His heart, like melting wax, was ready to take any seal of the word. A melting heart is fit to obey. When When the heart is like metal in the furnace, 
It is facile and malleable to anything. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Acts 9.6 A repenting soul subscribes to God's will and answers to his call as the echo to the voice. 2. Repentance is highly acceptable. When a spiritual river runs to water this garden, then our hearts are a garden of Eden, delightful to God. I have read that doves delight to be about the waters, and surely God's Spirit, who descended in the likeness of a dove, takes great delight in the waters of repentance. The Lord esteems no heart sound but the broken heart. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Psalm 51:17. Mary stood at Jesus' feet weeping. Luke 7:38. She brought two things to Christ, said Augustine, eugentum and lacrimus, ointment and tears. Her tears were better than her ointment. Tears are powerful orators for mercy. They are silent, yet they have a voice. The voice, the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. Psalm 6, verse 8. 3. Repentance commends all our services to God. That which is seasoned with the bitter herbs of godly sorrow is God's savory meat. Hearing of the word is then good when we are pricked at the heart. Acts 2:37. Prayer is delightful to God when it ascends from the altar of a broken heart. The publican smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This prayer pierced heaven. He went away justified rather than the other. Luke 18, verse 14. No prayer touches God's ear, but what comes from a heart touched with the sense of sin. 4. Without repentance nothing will avail us. Some bless themselves that they have a stock of knowledge, but what is knowledge good for without repentance? It is better to mortify one's sin than to understand all mysteries. Impure speculators do but resemble Satan, transformed into an angel of light. Learning and a bad heart is like a fair face with a cancer in the breast. Knowledge without repentance will be but a torch to light men to hell. 5. Repenting tears are delicious. They may be compared to myrrh, which though it is bitter in taste, has a sweet smell and refreshes the spirits. So repentance, though it is bitter in itself, yet it is sweet in the effects. It, bring, it brings inward peace. The soul is never more enlarged and inwardly delighted than when it can kindly melt. Alexander, upon the safe return of his admiral Nearchus, from a long voyage, wept for joy. Footnote. This is speaking of Alexander the Great of Macedonia, 356 to 323 BC. When Alexander's conquests reached as far as India, he required Nearchus to explore the Indian Ocean. End of footnote. How oft do the saints fall a-weeping for joy? The Hebrew word for repent signifies to take comfort. None so joyful as the penitent. Tears, as the philosopher notes, have four qualities. They are moist, salt, hot, and bitter. It is true of repenting tears. They are, heart, they are hot, to warm a frozen conscience. Moist, to soften a hard heart. Salt, to season a soul putrefying in sin. Bitter, to wean us from the love of the world. And I will add a fifth. They are sweet, in that they make the heart inwardly rejoice, and sorrow shall be turned into joy. Job 41.22 Let a man, said Augustine, grieve for his sin, and rejoice for his grief. Tears are the best sweetmeats. David, who was the great weeper in Israel, was the sweet singer of Israel. The sorrows of the penitent are like the sorrows of a travailing woman. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. John 16:21. So the sorrows of humbled sinners bring forth grace, and what joy there is when this man-child is born. 6. Great sins repented of shall find mercy. Mary Magdalene, a great sinner, obtained pardon when she washed Christ's feet with her tears. 
for some of the Jews who had a hand in crucifying Christ, upon their repentance, the very blood they shed was a sovereign balm to heal them. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Isaiah 1 verse 18 Scarlet in the Greek is called dibason because it is twice dipped. And the art of man cannot wash out the dye again. But though our sins are of a scarlet color, God's mercy can wash them away. This may comfort those whom the heinousness of their sin discourages, as if there were no hope for them. Yes, upon their serious turning to God, their sins shall be expunged and done away with. Oh, but my sins are out of measure sinful. Do not make them greater by not repenting. Repentance unravels sin and makes it as if it had never been done. Oh, but I have relapsed into sin after pardon, and surely there is no mercy for me. I know the Novatians held that after a lapse there was no renewing by repentance, but doubtless that was an error. Footnote The Novatians were an extreme Christian group of the 3rd century who were noted for their severity to Christians who stumbled and fell. End of footnote The children of God have relapsed into the same sin. Abraham did twice equivocate. Lot committed incest twice. Asa, a good king, yet sinned twice by creature confidence, and Peter twice by carnal fear. Matthew 26:70, Galatians 2, verse 12. But for the comfort of such as have relapsed into sin more than once, if they solemnly repent, a white flag of mercy shall be held forth to them. Christ commands us to forgive our trespassing brother seventy times seven in one day, in case he repents. Matthew 18, verse 22. If the Lord bids us do it, will not he be much more ready to forgive upon our repentance? What is our forgiving mercy to his? This I speak not to encourage any impenitent sinner, but to comfort a despondent sinner that thinks that it is vain that it is in vain for him to repent and that he is excluded from mercy. 7. Repentance is the inlet to spiritual blessings. It helps to enrich us with grace. It causes the desert to blossom as the rose. It makes the soul as the Egyptian fields after the overflowing of the Nile, flourishing and fruitful. Never do the flowers of grace grow more than after a shower of repentant tears. Repentance causes knowledge. When their heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. 2 Corinthians 3.16 The veil of ignorance which was drawn over the Jews' eyes shall by repentance be taken away. Repentance inflames love. Weeping Mary Magdalene loved much. Luke 7.47 God preserves these springs of sorrow in the soul to water the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 8. Repentance ushers in temporal blessings. The prophet Joel, persuading the people to repentance, brings in the promise of secular good things. Rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil. Joel 2, verse 13 and 19. When we put water into the pump, it fetches up only water. But when we put the water of tears into God's bottle, this fetches up wine. I will send you wine and oil. Sin blasts the fruit, the fruits of the earth. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Haggai 1 verse 6 But, but repentance makes the pomegranate bud, and the vine flourish with full clusters. Fill God's bottle, and he will fill your basket. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt lay up gold as dust. Job 22 verse 23 and 24 Repenting is a returning to God, and this brings a golden harvest. 9. Repentance, repentance staves off judgments from a land. When God is going to destroy a nation, the penitent sinner stays his hand, as the angel did Abraham's. Genesis 22.12 The Ninevites' repentance caused God to repent. God saw that they turned from their evil way, 
and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Jonah 3 verse 10 An outward repentance has adjourned and kept off wrath. Ahab sold himself to work wickedness, yet upon his fasting and rending his garments, God said to Elijah, I will not bring the evil in his days. 1 Kings 21 verse 29 If the rending of the clothes kept off judgment from the nation, what will the rending of the heart do? 10. Repentance makes joy in heaven. The angels do, as it were, keep holy day. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Luke 15 verse 10 As praise is the music of heaven, so repentance is the joy of heaven. When men neglect the offer of salvation and freeze in sin, this delights the devils. But when a soul is brought home to Christ by repentance, this makes joy among the angels. 11. Consider how, how dear our sins cost Christ. To consider how, how dear our sins cost Christ may cause tears to distill from our eyes. Christ is called the rock, 1 Corinthians 10.4. When his hands were pierced with nails, and the spear thrust in his side, then was this rock smitten, and there came out water and blood. And all this Christ endured for us. The Messiah shall be cut off, not for, but not for himself. Daniel 9.26 We tasted the apple, and he the vinegar and gall. We sinned in every faculty, and he bled in every vein flesh like love engraved on the whole body. Can we look upon a suffering Savior with dry eyes? Shall we not be sorry for those sins which made Christ a man of sorrow? Shall not our enormities which drew blood from Christ draw tears from us? Shall we sport any more with sin and so rake in Christ's wounds? Oh, that by repentance we would crucify our sins afresh. The Jews said to Pilate, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. John 19.12 If we let our sins go and do not crucify them, we are not Christ's friends. 12. This is the end of all afflictions which God sends, whether it be sickness in our bodies or losses in our estates, that he may awaken us out of our sins and make the waters of repentance flow. Why did God lead Israel that march in the wilderness among fiery serpents, but that he might humble them? Deuteronomy 8, verse 2. Why did he bring Manasseh so low, changing his crown of gold into fetters of iron, but that he might learn repentance? He humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Second Chronicles 33, verse 12 and 13. One of the best ways to cure a man of his lethargy is to cast him into a fever. Likewise, when a person is stupefied and his conscience grown lethargical, God, to cure him of this distemper, puts him to extremity and brings one burning calamity or another that he may startle him out of his security and make him return to him by repentance. 13. Our d the days of our mourning will soon be ended. After a few showers that fall from our eyes, we shall have perpetual sunshine. God will provide a handkerchief to wipe off his people's tears. God shall wipe away all tears. Revelation 7:17. 7, Christians, you will shortly put on your garments of praise. You will exchange your sackcloth for white robes. Instead of sighs, you will have triumphs. Instead of groans, anthems. Instead of water of tears, the water of life. The morning of the dove will be past, and the time of the singing of birds will come. Songs fly to and fro above the heavens. This brings me to the next point. 14. The happy and glorious reward that follows upon repentance. Being made free from sin, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. Romans 6.22 The leaves and root of the fig tree are bitter, but the fruit is sweet. Repentance to the fleshy part seems bitter, but behold, sweet fruit, everlasting life. 
The Turks fancy after this life an Elysium, or paradise of pleasure, where dainty dishes will be served in, and they will have gold in abundance, silken and purple apparel, and angels will bring them red wine in silver cups and golden plates. Here is an epicure's heaven, but in the true paradise of God there are astonishing delights, and rare viands served in, which eye hath not seen, neither have entered into the heart of man. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 God will lead his penitents from the house of mourning to the banqueting house. There will be no sight there but of glory, no noise but of music, no sickness unless of love. There shall be holiness unspotted and joy unspeakable. Then the saints shall forget their solitary hours and be sweetly solacing themselves in God and bathing in the rivers of divine pleasure. O Christian, what are your duties compared with the recompense of reward? What an infinite disproportion is there between repentance enjoined and glory prepared? There was a feast day at Rome when they used to crown their fountains. God will crown those heads, those heads which have been fountains of tears. Who, who would not be willing to be a while in the house of mourning who shall be possessed of such glory as put Peter and John into an ecstasy to see it even darkly shadowed and portrayed in the, in the transfiguration? Matthew 17 This reward which free grace gives is so transcendently great that could we have but a glimpse of glory revealed to us here, we should need patience to be content to live any longer. O blessed repentance that has such a light side with the dark and has so much sugar at the bottom of the bitter cup. 15. The next motive to repentance is to consider the evil of impenitence. A hard heart is the worst heart. It is called a heart of stone. Ezekiel 36.26 If it were iron, it might be mollified in the furnace, but a stone put in the fire will not melt. It will sooner fly in your face. Impenitence is a sin that grieves Christ. Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. Mark 3 verse 5 It is not so much the disease that offends the physician as the contempt of his physic. It is not so much the sins we have committed that so provoke and grieve Christ as that we refuse the physic of repentance which he prescribes. This aggravated Jezebel's sin. I gave her space to repent and she repented not. Revelation 2 verse 21 A hard heart receives no impression. It is untuned for every duty. It was a sad speech Stephen Gardiner uttered on his deathbed. I have denied my master with Peter, but I cannot repent with Peter. Oh, the plague of an obdurate heart! Footnote Stephen Gardiner was a Roman Catholic bishop, a chief opponent of the Reformation of the 16th century. He urged the reintroduction of laws for the burning of Protestants. End of footnote Pharaoh's heart turned into stone, was worse than his waters turned into blood. David had his choice of three judgments, plague, sword, and famine, but he would have chosen them all rather than a hard heart. An impenitent sinner is neither allured by entreaties nor affrighted by menaces. Such as will not weep with Peter shall weep like Judas. A hard heart is the anvil on which the hammer of God's justice will be striking to all eternity. 16. The last motive to repentance is that the day of judgment is coming. This is the Apostle's own argument. God commands all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Acts 17, verse 30 and 31. There is that in the day of judgment which may make a stony heart bleed. Will a man go on thieving when the assizes are nigh? Will the sinner go on sinning when the day of judgment is so nigh? You can no more conceal your sin than you can defend it. And what will you do when all your sins shall be written in God's book and engraven on your forehead? O direful day, when Jesus Christ, clothed in his judge's robe, shall say to the sinner, Stand forth 
answer to the indictment brought against you. What can you say for all your oaths, adulteries, and your desperate impenitence? Oh, how amazed and stricken with consternation shall the sinner be! And after his conviction he must hear the sad sentence, Depart from me! Then, he that would not repent of his sins shall repent of his folly. If there be such a time coming wherein God will judge men for their impieties, what a spur this should be to repentance. The penitent soul shall at the last day lift up his head with comfort and have a discharge to show under the judge's own hand. Chapter 8 Exhortations to Speedy Repentance the second branch of the exhortation is to press persons to speedy repentance. Now God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17.30 The Lord would not have any of the late autumn fruits offered to him. God loves early penitents that consecrate the spring and flower of their age to him. Early tears, like pearls bred of the morning dew, are more orient and beautiful. O oh, do not reserve the dregs of your age for God, lest he reserve the dregs of his cup for you. Be as speedy in your repentance as you, would God, as you would have God speedy in his mercies. The king's business required haste. 1 Samuel 21.8 Therefore repentance requires haste. It is natural to us to procrastinate and put off repentance. We say, as Haggai did, The time is not to come. Haggai 1 verse 2 No man is so bad but he purposes to amend but he adjourns and prorogues so long until at last all his purposes prove abortive. Many are now in hell that purposed to repent. Satan does what he can to keep men from repentance. When he sees that they be begin to take up serious thoughts of reformation he bids them wait a little longer. If this traitor sin must die, says Satan, let it not die yet. So the devil gets a reprieve for sin. It shall not die this session. At last men put off so long that death seizes on them, and their work is not done. Let me therefore lay down some cogent arguments to persuade to speedy repentance. 1. Now is the season of repentance, and everything best is best done in its season. Now is the accepted time. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 Now God has a mind to show mercy to the penitent. He is on the giving hand. Kings set apart days for healing. Now is the healing day for our souls. Now God hangs forth the white flag and is willing to parley with sinners. A prince at his coronation as an act of royalty gives money, proclaims pardons, fills the conduits with wine. Now God promises pardon to the penitent sinners. Now the conduit of the gospel runs wine. Now is the accepted time. Therefore come in now and make your peace with God. Break off your iniquities now by repentance. It is wisdom to take the season. The husbandman takes the season for sowing his seed. Now is the seed time for our souls. 2. The sooner you repent the fewer sins you will have to answer for. At the deathbed of an old sinner, where conscience begins to be awakened, you will hear him crying out, Here are all my old sins come about me, haunting my deathbed as so many evil spirits, and I have no discharge. Here is Sa Satan, who was once my tempter, now become an accuser, and I have no advocate. I am now going to be dragged before God's judgment seat, where I must receive my final doom. Oh, how dismal is the case of this man! He is in hell before his time. But you who repent betimes of your sinful courses, this is your privilege. You will have the less to answer for. Indeed, let me tell you, you will have nothing to answer for. Christ will answer for you. Your judge will be your advocate. 1 John 2, 1 Father, Christ will say, here is one that has been a great sinner, yet a broken-hearted sinner. If he owes anything to your justice, set it on my score. Third, 
the sooner we repent, the more glory we may bring to God. It is the end of our living to be useful in our generation. Better lose our lives than the end of our living. Late converts who have for many years taken pay on the devil's side are not in a capacity of doing so much work in the vineyard. The thief on the cross could not do that service for God as St. Paul did. But when we do betimes turn from sin, then we give God the first fruits of our lives. We spend and are spent for Christ. The more work we do for God, the more willing we shall be to die, and the sweeter death will be. He, he that has wrought hard at his day labor is willing to go to rest at night. Such as have been honoring God all their lives how sweetly will they sleep in the grave. The more work we do for God, the greater will our reward be. He whose pound has gained ten pounds, Christ did not only command him, but advance him. Have thou authority over ten cities. Luke 19.17 By late repentance, though we do not lose our crown, yet we make it lighter. 4. It is of dangerous consequence to put off repentance longer. Procrastination brings dangers. It is dangerous if we consider what sin is. Sin is a poison. It is dangerous to let poison lie long in the body. Sin is a bruise. If a bruise be not soon cured, it gangrenes and kills. If sin be not soon cured by repentance, it festers the conscience and damns. Why should any love to dwell in the tents of wickedness? They are under the power of Satan. Acts 26.18 And it is dangerous to stay long in the enemy's quarters. It is dangerous to procrastinate repentance because the longer any go on in sin, the harder they will find the work of repentance. Delay strengthens sin and hardens the heart and gives the devil fuller possession. A plant at first may be easily plucked up, but when it has spread its roots deep in the earth, a whole team cannot remove it. It is hard to remove sin when once it becomes when it once it comes to be rooted. The longer the ice freezes, the harder it is to be broken. The longer a man freezes in security, the harder it will be to have his heart broken. The longer any travail with iniquity, the sharper pangs they must expect in the new birth. When sin has got a haunt, it is not easily shaken off. Sin comes to a sinner as the elder brother came to his father. Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Luke 15.29 And wilt thou cast me off now? What, in my old age, after you have had so much pleasure by me? See how sin pleads custom, and that is a leopard spot. Jeremiah 13.23 It is a dangerous prologue to delay repentance, because there are three days, that may soon expire. 1. The day of the gospel may expire. This is a sunshiny day. It is sweet, but swift. Jerusalem had a day, but lost it. But now they are hid from thine eyes. Luke 19.42 The Asian churches had a day, but at last the golden ga- candlestick was removed. It would be a sad time in England to see the glory departed. With what hearts could we follow the gospel to the grave? To lose the gospel were far worse than to have our city charter taken from us. Gray hairs are here and there. Hosea 7 verse 9 I will not say the sun of the gospel is set in England, but I am sure it is under a cloud. That was a sad speech. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Matthew 21 43 Therefore it is dangerous to delay repentance lest the market of the gospel should remove and the vision cease. Second, a man's personal day of grace may expire. What if that time should come when God should say the means of grace shall do no good? Ordinances shall have a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Hosea 9.14 Were it not sad to adjourn repentance till such a decree came forth? It is true, no man can justly tell that his day of grace is past, but there are two shrewd signs by which he may fear it. The first, when conscience has done preaching. Conscience is a bosom preacher. Sometimes it convinces, 
sometimes it reproves. It says, as Nathan to David, Thou art the man. 2 Samuel 12, verse 7. But men imprison this preacher, and God says to conscience, Preach no more. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. Revelation 22, verse 11. This is a fatal sign that a man's day of grace is past. Second, when a person in, is in such a spiritual lethargy that nothing will work upon him or make him sensible. There is the spirit of deep sleep poured out upon you. Isaiah 29, verse 10. This is a sad presage that his day of grace is past. How dangerous then is it to delay repentance when the day of grace may so soon expire? 3. The day of life may expire. What security have we that we shall live another day? We are marching apace out of the world. We are going off the stage. Our life is a taper soon blown out. Man's life is compared to the flower of the field which withers sooner than the grass. Psalm 103.15 Our age is as nothing. Psalm 39 verse 5 Life is but a flying shadow. The body is like a vessel filled with a little breath. Sickness broaches this vessel. Death draws it out. Oh, how soon may the scene alter. Many a virgin has been dressed the same day in her bride apparel and her winding sheet. How dangerous then is it to adjourn repenting when death may so suddenly make a thrust at us. Say not that you will repent tomorrow. Remember that speech of Aquinas, who was in the 13th century one of the most famous of Roman Catholic theologians, Thomas Aquinas. He said, God who pardons him that repents has not promised to give him tomorrow to repent in. I have read of Archaeus, a Lacedaemonian, that is an early name for Sparta in southern Greece, who was among his cups when one delivered him a letter and desired him to read the letter presently, which was of serious business. He replied, Syria crass, that is, I will mind serious things tomorrow. And that day he was slain. Thus, while men think to spin out their silver thread, death cuts it. Olaus Magnus, that is a 16th century Swedish ecclesiastic who wrote on Scandinavian customs and folklore, observes of the birds of Norway that they fly faster than the birds of any other country. Not that their wings are swifter than others, but by an instinct of nature, they, knowing the days in that climate to be that very short, not above three hours long, do therefore the, make the more haste to their nests. So we, knowing the shortness of our lives and how quickly we may be called away by death, should fly so much the faster on the wing of repentance to heaven. But some will say that they do not fear a sudden surprisal, they will repent upon their sickbed. I do not much like a sickbed repentance. He who will venture his salvation within the circle of a few short minutes runs a desperate hazard. You who put off repentance till sickness answer me to these four queries. First, how do you know that you shall have a time of sickness? Death does not always shoot its warning piece by a lingering consumption. Some it arrests suddenly. What if God should presently send you a summons to surrender your life? Second, Suppose you should have a time of sickness, how do you know that you shall have the use of your senses? Many are distracted on their sickbed. Third, suppose you should have your senses, yet how do you know that your mind will be in a frame for such a work as repentance? Sickness does so discompose body and mind that one is but in an ill posture at such a time to take care for his soul. In sickness, a man is scarce fit to make his will much less to make his peace. The apostle said, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. James 5.14 He does not say, Is he sick? Let him pray. But let him call for the elders, that they may pray over him. A sick man is very unfit to pray or repent. He is likely to make but sick work of it. When the body is out of tune, the soul must needs jar in its devotion. 
Upon a sick bed, a person is more fit to exercise impatience than repentance. We read that at the pouring out of the fourth vial, when God did smite the inhabitants and scorch them with fire, that they blasphemed the name of God and repented not. Revelation 16 verse 9 So when the Lord pours out his vial and scorches the body with a fever, the sinner is fitter to blaspheme than to repent. Fourth, how do you who put off all to a sick bed know that God will give you in that very juncture of time grace to repent? The Lord usually punishes neglect of repentance in time of health with hardness of heart in time of sickness. You have in your lifetime repulsed the Spirit of God, and are you sure He will come at your call? You have not taken the first season, and perhaps you shall never see another springtide of the Spirit again. All this considered may hasten our repentance. Do not lay too much weight upon a sick bed. Do thy diligence to come before winter. 2 Timothy 4.21 There is a winter of sickness and death a-coming. Therefore make haste to repent. Let your work be ready for before winter. Today hear God's voice. Hebrews 3, verse 7. Chapter 9 The Trial of Our Repentance and the Comfort for the Penitent If any shall say they have repented, let me desire them to try themselves seri- seriously by those seven adjuncts or effects of repentance which the Apostle lays down in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 11. 1. Carefulness The Greek word signifies a solicitous diligence or careful shunning all temptations to sin. The true penitent flies from sin as Moses did from the serpent. 2. Clearing of ourselves The Greek word is apology. The sense is this, though we have much care, yet through strength of temptation we we may slip into sin. Now in this case the repenting soul will not not let sin lie festering in his conscience, but judges himself for his sin. He pours out tears before the Lord. He begs mercy in the name of Christ, and never leaves till he has gotten his pardon. Here he is cleared of guilt in his conscience, and is able to make an apology for himself against Satan. 3. Indignation He that repents of sin, his spirit rises against it, as one's blood as one's blood rises at the sight of him who he mortally hates. Indignation is a being fretted at the heart with sin. The penitent is vexed with himself. David calls himself a fool and a beast. Psalm 73.22 God is never better pleased with us than when we fall out with ourselves for sin. 4. Fear A tender heart is ever a trembling heart. The penitent has felt sin's bitterness. This hornet has stung him and now, having hopes that God is reconciled, he is afraid to come near sin any more. The repenting soul is full of fear. He is afraid to lose God's favor which is better than life. He is afraid he should, for want of diligence, come short of salvation. He is afraid, lest after his heart has been soft, the waters of repentance should freeze, and he should harden in sin again. Happy is the man that feareth alway, Proverbs 28.14. A sinner is like the Leviathan, who is made without fear, Job 41.33. A repenting person fears and sins not, A graceless person sins and fears not. 5. Vehement Desire As sour sauce sharpens the appetite, so the bitter herbs of repentance sharpen desire. But what does the penitent desire? He desires more power against sin and to be released from it. It is true, he has got loose from Satan, but but he goes as a prisoner that has broken out of prison with a fetter on his leg. He cannot walk with that freedom and swiftness in the ways of God. He desires, therefore, to have the fetters of sin taken off. He would be freed from corruption. He cries out with Paul, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Romans 7.24 In short, he desires to be with Christ, as everything desires to be in its center. 6. Zeal 
Desire and zeal are fitly put together to show that true desire puts forth itself in zealous endeavor. How does the penitent bestir himself in the business of salvation? How does he take the kingdom of heaven by force? Matthew 11 verse 12 Zeal quickens this pursuit after glory. Zeal, encountering difficulty, is emboldened by opposition and tramples upon danger. Zeal makes a repenting soul persist in godly sorrow against all discouragements and oppositions whatsoever. Zeal carries a man above himself for God's glory. Paul, before his conversion, was mad against the saints, Acts 26.11, and after conversion he was judged mad for Christ's sake. Paul, thou art beside thyself, Acts 26.24, but it was zeal, not frenzy. Zeal animates spirit and duty. It causes fervency in religion, which is as fire to the sacrifice, Romans 12.11. As fear is a bridle to sin, so zeal is a spur to duty. This Reformation audio resource is a production of Still Waters Revival Books. There is no copyright on this material, and we encourage you to reproduce it and pass it on to your friends. Many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at area code 780-450-3730, by fax at area code 780-468-1096, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. T6L3T5. If you do not have a web connection, please request a free printed catalog.